Good morning, everyone. Day two or day three for those of you who are with us for the awesome Allies in Action training on Sunday. Welcome to AllyCon again, all of you, including those who are joining today for the first time this week. I know there are some people who were not with us yesterday. I'm Andrea Goodman, for those who I didn't meet yesterday with the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. And I'm so grateful to all of you who are listening today from home. I know we spoke yesterday in the chat and in sessions about how hard it is to do this apart. It's hard to do it without the hugging, the laughter, the tears, all those hallway chats. But I know we are sitting in our own homes, drinking from our own mugs with comfy clothes on, even I have slippers on today, and feeling connected to each other anyway. This is a bittersweet day because it is our last together, but I'm looking forward to the next few hours together. Today, we get to several topics that we heard from you who are important in Blue Hope Nation when we asked you months ago. So today we'll hear about surveillance options, lots of new medical advancements in survivorship. We'll hear about diet, mental health for both patients and caregivers with separate breakouts for each and a few other things. And stay tuned later for some award announcements and prizes from our photo contest and leaderboard winner. Thank you for all who participated and check out the photos tab to see all of the fun entries. I was looking at the contest entries earlier today. Lots of fun photos. And just a few notes of housekeeping while I have you. A reminder that all of these recordings will be, repo will be posted after the conference. So those of you who were not able to participate in some of the sessions yesterday, they will be available to you. You can also rate each session right inside that presentation view. If you scroll under where you see me, um, it says rate this session and tell us what you thought so we can make it better next year. It is really important that we hear from you. And we will be sharing some other opportunities in the app today or in the Whova platform, including ways to get involved with the Alliance this month. We have Giving Tuesday coming up and other events just around the corner. So today is not the end. With that, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. John Marshall, who of course many of you know and respect just as we do. John Marshall is Chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology at the MedStar Georgetown University Hospital and Director of the Roosh Center of, for the Cure of Gastrointestinal Cancer, among many other hats. Thanks again for being here, Dr. Marshall, and I will turn it over to you for your presentation. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. John Marshall from Georgetown University's the Roosh Center for the Cure of GI Cancers. And I'm really very, very excited to be part of the Colorectal Cancer Alliance's uh, meeting and symposium. Um, I have enjoyed a long standing relationship with the Alliance and our center and your team are, are one and the same. We are family. And so uh, when I was asked to come and provide some of my insights and thoughts, um, I was jumped at the chance and, and delighted to do it. So I'm glad you are joining in as well to talk about this concept of, of survivorship. And we're kind of calling this the survivorship roller coaster because um, we all want to be survivors. That's the name of the game. But it is an emotional roller coaster that comes and goes uh, over time. And I want to kind of paint this picture of what it's like, what we deal with on our side, what you as patients may deal with on your side, caregivers as well, and talk about some of the new technology that's out there that may make this process easier, at least more, more transparent. But let's kind of start from the beginning because, you know, where this whole story begins is with the diagnosis because that's what you're surviving in the end. Um, and so when people first are diagnosed with colon cancer, whether that's an early stage or a later stage disease, their life changes on a dime. Um, you go living your life pretty normally, maybe a little COVID, maybe an election here and there, um, but otherwise life's moving along and then wham, you run into this glass wall that you didn't see coming and you now have this new diagnosis of colon cancer. And almost everybody at that point for a while 
more or less freaks out. It's very unstable, unsteady. You almost don't feel like the world is underneath you, that you're not on solid ground. Um, your brain is racing. You don't know which way is which. Your executive function is lost. You don't remember how many children you have. You don't know where your car keys are. And the early part of a diagnosis is one of gathering all of the information and trying to make the best decision of how you're going to get treated, who's going to be your doctors, who's going to be your healthcare team, what it's going to be like, how it's going to affect your life. And you're incorporating all of this new information. And then you sort of go from that diagnosis phase into the first part of survivorship, and that's treatment. And you initiate treatment. That could be surgery. It could be chemotherapy after surgery, et cetera. Uh, but you begin treatment. And in some ways, this treatment phase becomes the kind of a reassurance almost that it's a comfortable blanket. It has a rhythm to it. You know what you're doing. Um, it, it has a schedule. Um, you're acting against your cancer. You're doing something to treat and your cancer and hopefully be cured uh, of your cancer. So in an odd sort of way, the active treatment phase of survivorship um, is uh, in fact comfortable, is, um, uh, is, is reassured. And then you sort of stop that treatment. In a classic uh, a set of survivorship uh, models, you're done with your treatment. So this is really for stage one, two, and three patients, some stage four patients, where now you're done. You're not good. You're done your surgery. You've done your chemotherapy. We've done stuff to you. We've left a divot behind as clinicians, as medical people. Um, but now you're not doing anything anymore. And so in essence, what you've been told is we're going to wait and see how things go. And this is really where the emotional roller coaster starts for me, for most of our patients. Um, it's as if we took the security blanket off and said, all right, go and fly. You're, you're, you're on your own and off you go to make sure, see if you're going to be okay or not for the rest of your life. And so as more and more people all around the world are being cured of their cancers, or if not cured, surviving longer and longer with their cancers, we have developed this concept of survivorship that at first, particularly when I was a younger oncologist, all we really cared about is, are you going to die or not? We wanted to do everything we could to keep you from dying, regardless of the cost, regardless of the side effects that it caused. But as we've gotten to this new phase of our world of oncology, where we are more successful and we have more survivors, we've shifted our thinking. We still want to maintain that very high level of cure as much as we can, but at less cost, can we make the subsequent damage, if you will, the chronic damage from being cured of your cancer, treated from your cancer, less? Can we improve your long-term survival? And that's where survivorship comes in. And this has really been a very important phase for the world of oncology. And it's very particularly important in the world of colorectal cancer. And I'll, I'll go into that. Normally, at the end of treatment, actually, I usually do it on the first date when we're seeing patients, again, with stage one, two, or three colon cancer. I often use the exact same line as I am wont to do and basically say, if there's no evidence of disease of your cancer recurring, three years from now, you may throw a small party. Usually gets a smile. Um, if you go five years from now, I say, you can have a big party. Because for colorectal cancer, almost every patient, if there is cancer lurking out there somewhere, it will show up again by three years. 95% of cases will have shown up by three years. And another 5% will show up in the subsequent two years. So all of our strategy for following people for five years from their diagnosis is based on that simple observation that if there are cells that have been left behind that didn't get pulled out by surgery or didn't get cured by the chemotherapy, if, if they are out there, they're going to show up within the first three years typically, but you're almost never after five. And so 
oncologists follow patients for that five-year window. And what we are doing in those what we call well baby visits is just making sure there's no evidence of the cancer coming back. And how we do this has evolved over time. So when, again, a long time ago when I first trained, we did CAT scans all the time, quarterly CAT scans and CEAs. And we watched like a hawk in order to see something early so before you felt it as a patient so that we could do something about it. Um, as the science evolved, we realized that we probably didn't need to do scans quite so often. Um, CEAs may be still useful to be doing, um, but to kind of keep track, why are we looking? Why are we hunting? Why are we doing these scans on patients after their original surgeries? Um, well, the real reason is that some patients who have a relapse of their cancer can be cured again through surgery or other techniques. So I always say, if you have one or two weeds in your yard, if we literally remove those through surgery, some people are cured by that. So the concept of close follow-up in this survivorship window is one, to try and find early relapses that we might be able to cure. If you go to the breast cancer literature, for example, they don't do scans at all. They do some basic blood work and a physical exam because in their world, picking it up a little sooner than later doesn't really help in the long run. And so in the colon cancer world, though, it does. And so we do scans every now and then, blood tests every now and then in the quest to see, is there recurrent cancer and can we do anything about it? all the way up to can we cure it for metastatic disease. What we're not doing in those visits is really worrying too much about your side effects, about your neuropathy, about your fatigue, about your emotional peace, just because we're so happy that you're okay, that your scans are quiet, your CEA is negative. But more and more, we're recognizing that we must address that element of the whole survivorship process. And you know as well as I do, there's something called scanxiety. So you're doing fine, you're not having any symptoms, but then you look in your calendar and you're like, oh gosh, and I'm due for my scan. And so you call and you get your order and, and, and you start to have symptoms, right? So every ache or pain, every headache, every muscle ache, the first thing on your list is all of a sudden, oh my gosh, that's the cancer. The cancer has come back and your anxiety goes up and up and up. And then you get up that one morning, you go in and you take your scan and you do your CEA blood test and you log on to the portal of your hospital system every three minutes to wait for that report to come back. And you don't exhale until you see that everything is okay. And then all of a sudden, all those aches and pains go away and your, your anxiety level falls and you knew all along that you were fine, but you needed to be reassured. And so that roller coaster ride of one scan to the next um, is, can take a big toll on people. Um, and so you're not a hypochondriac, right? We all have aches and pains, but most of us don't think that that ache and pain could be a recurrent cancer. And so you're appropriate in your anxiety about a symptom. And the advice we give our patients is to make sure and uh, tell us when those symptoms are coming so that we can uh, deal with it. But apart from just relapse or not, um, it's also equally important to address the other issues. Um, whether it's your GI tract that's now been distorted, neuropathy from the chemotherapy, uh, or other uh, consequences uh, of your treatment. Uh, and so out of this has blossomed another, if you will, kind of subspecialty of primary care focused on cancer survivorship, globally colon cancer in specific. So if you've not been offered a survivorship visit I would recommend that you you get one. It's somebody who kind of goes through the entire process of what's happened to you, physical and emotional, and helps coach you to try and optimize, reduce, reverse the symptoms as much as possible. To address one of those big deals, I did want to do a particular shout out uh, to some work in the in the postoperative adjuvant chemotherapy space, because as you may know, the old standard was to give six months 
of chemotherapy, one of the drugs being a drug called oxaloplatin. And if you give six months of oxaloplatin to anybody, you get bad neuropathy. And so to try and lessen that, a huge global study was done where half the patients got six months of treatment and the other half got three. And three months of this treatment doesn't really cause permanent neuropathy, at least not in most patients. And so what was delightful to see is that three months played just as well as six months of therapy. And so this is in response, if you will, to the survivorship movement that can you get the same benefit without the added side effects? And so this movement is having a dramatic and positive impact uh, on the lives and the quality of life of colorectal cancer patients uh, out there. Now, I did mention earlier about a new technology that we think is really gonna be maybe helpful in um, monitoring people um, uh, afterwards. Because if you think about it, you've had your surgery, your scans are negative, your CEA is normal, uh, you take some chemo because you think you're supposed to, um, and then you cross your fingers. Well, the reality is you don't really even know that after surgery that you had any cancer left. You could have been cured by the surgery, by the initial surgery, and not need the chemotherapy. Um, on the other end, let's say you did have microscopic metastatic disease, and then you get your chemo, and let's say it still is around. What you're waiting for through that three to five year window is those seeds to show up and grow. And I challenge you, would you want to know then that indeed you've still got cancer? Because in fact, that's what this new technology may enable us to do. So what is called a CTDNA or circulating tumor DNA. And it's pretty cool. So what they do is they take your cancer, our cancers, and they analyze the snot out of them. And from that, make an individual fingerprint, if you will, of that person's cancer. So your fingerprint would be different than that person's fingerprint. And then we send a tube of blood. And with this really neat technology that we have now, they can drill down on that tube of blood and find even the smallest fragment of mutations that were seen in your cancer. And if those mutations are detectable in the tube of blood, it almost 100% means you've still got cancer out there somewhere. And so if you did your surgery and this tube of blood was positive, you definitely should be getting this chemotherapy. Now, what we don't know yet is if the tube of blood is negative, right? It's good, we want it to be negative. Don't hear anything different than that. But what's not absolutely perfect yet is that that negative test, that one negative test says, no, there isn't any cancer and therefore you don't need chemotherapy. It makes the odds much higher that you're okay and don't need the chemo, but it's not so perfect that we are ready today to withhold that chemotherapy. Um, so we're still gonna treat that patient right, with even the negative blood test. But if your test was positive, we're gonna treat you. And the expectation is that the blood test becomes negative. So now we can't detect any circulating tumor DNA. And then we follow patients using that test currently in addition to scans and everything else. But my guess is, my hope is, that eventually this test will replace those scans will replace that three to five years of follow-up so that you don't have to wait around. If the other shoe's going to drop, let's know about it right away and let's start, try to do something about it. If you're okay, let's send you on your way and quit doing those follow-up scans one after the other um, in looking for something that's out there. So, this is a new technology, only really about a year old in the clinic, um, something that many of us are incorporating into our thinking, but do hear that we're not 100% sure exactly how to incorporate it into everything we do. Um, as sort of a last comment, I do wanna make sure that all of our patients out there know that there are things we can do, we think, to help prevent cancer from 
um, uh, recurring um, and maybe prevent a new cancer. And there are sort of four things. One is exercise. There's really great evidence that in the survivorship window, exercise is a great thing to do. One of those things that all of us during COVID are doing more of. So keep that up. Um, the second is um, taking, there is some data around baby aspirin. That's one of those things where you talk with your own doctor about whether that's appropriate or not. Tree nuts, believe it or not, eating tree nuts, not peanuts, tree nuts is a good thing. Coffee, a lot of coffee um, has been shown to help and vitamin D, believe it or not. So if you think about those things, all four of those things, um, they are probably affecting what we call our microbiome. And so there is an increasing science that is, and the fund, many of which is funded by the Colorectal Cancer Alliance, that's looking at the impact of our behaviors, nutritional and exercise-like behaviors, um, uh, to see how we can control um, not only new cancers, but old cancers coming back. So you go from your glass wall wham of the new diagnosis of cancer, the comfort blanket of being on treatment, released to the wild of terror of, of hypochondria, where you're not sure if you're okay or not. New technologies are coming that I think will inform things better and new interventions, things like exercise, vitamin D, a good cup of coffee and some tree nuts may in fact help keep us out of trouble. So do make sure you are taking care of yourself. Yes, be happy that you are survived your cancer or are surviving your cancer, but also do everything you can to try and optimize your quality of life um, so that the survivorship roller coasters hills are not quite so steep, but the thrill on the way down is just as good. So thank you all very much for your attention. John Marshall for the Roosh Center and for the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Hello, uh, my name is Ahmed Hoke. I'm a professor of neurology and neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University. And today I'm going to be talking about peripheral neuropathy after chemotherapy. Um, first of all, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the impact of peripheral neuropathy in general, um, because you know, chemotherapy due to uh, you know, peripheral neuropathy due to chemotherapy is one component or one type of peripheral neuropathy but there are over 20 million Americans who suffer from all forms of peripheral neuropathy. Uh, there are more than 100 different types of peripheral neuropathies. And as you can see on the right side panel, uh, diabetes is probably the most common cause followed by idiopathic or unknown cause of peripheral neuropathy. And then the third biggest category is the um, cancer-related uh, peripheral neuropathy that is due to either direct effects of the cancer or as a consequence of the chemotherapy. Uh, there are many patients uh, with diabetes or HIV are also living with peripheral neuropathy and uh, cancer survivors, about 30 to 40% will have peripheral neuropathy. Uh, unfortunately, the funding for peripheral neuropathy research is very low and that is reflected in, you know, with the fact that we really do not have any uh, treatment that actually cures peripheral neuropathy, and even the existing drugs that treat the symptoms are only partially effective. So what is peripheral neuropathy? Uh, think of peripheral neuropathy uh, as a generic term that describes disease of the peripheral nerves. And peripheral nerves are like electrical wire in a uh, house. They connect the um, brain and spinal cord to the rest of the body. You have different types of peripheral nerves. Um, you have the motor nerves that goes to your muscles. And when those nerve fibers are abnormal, you get muscle wasting and weakness. And then you have autonomic nerve fibers that goes to your internal organs. And when those are abnormal, you get a problem with bodily functions, such as persistent nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, incontinence, sweating abnormalities, or blood pressure issues. And then uh, you have two different types of sensory nerve fibers. One group are called large sensory nerve fibers. These are the ones that go from your uh, limbs to back to the brain and carry the perception of balance. So even if you close your eyes, you know where your hand or feet is, and that's the job of those nerve fibers. When those nerve fibers are abnormal, 
you will walk like a drunk, you will have poor balance. And then the uh, large group of uh, other sensory nerve fibers are these small sensory nerve fibers that goes to the skin. And these are the ones that are responsible for your perception of pain, touch, temperature, and so forth. And these are the nerve fibers that often get affected in uh, paraffin neuropathies first. And they're also the reason often patients seek medical attention because uh, pain is a big uh, symptom of paraffin neuropathy. And then when we talk about paraffin nerves, there are actually two uh, parts to the, each paraffin nerve. The ones that um, actually an extension of the nerve fiber, as you can see in this image, is called the axon. So that's the nerve fiber itself. When that degenerates, uh, the only way you can get that function back is by basically regenerating the nerve fiber. But then there's a second component in the nerve, that's the insulation. It's like the electrical wiring insulation, and that's called myelin. And there are certain diseases that affect the myelin preferentially. And the good thing is that when there's a disease involved, uh, involving myelin, uh, that can actually repair itself and regenerate and recover function relatively quickly. So one of the common features of all paraffin neuropathies is that it is what we call length dependent. That is the degeneration starts in the hands and feet and slowly moves up. Uh, that's why most patients who get chemotherapy and develop neuropathy from chemo will complain of pain and numbness in their hands and feet. So what are the signs and symptoms of paraffin neuropathy? As you can see from these images, the majority of them that really bothers the patients are gonna be the painful symptoms. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, when the small sensory nerve fibers are abnormal, you get pain and paresthesias. These are the unusual sensations, and these can be experienced as burning uh, or prickling sensations or uh, many things, uh, uh, biting your toes or feet. Um, you can have pins and needles sensations. Um, but at the same time, these patients also feel a numbness or lack of sensation because those nerve fibers in the feet are degenerating and they're no longer connected to the skin. And so it, in the same patient, they experience both numbness as well as pain in the same distribution of the nerve fiber. When the large sensory nerve fibers are abnormal, you get poor balance, as I mentioned uh, before. And with the motor nerve fibers, you get weakness and muscle atrophy, but at the same time, you may also experience what we call fasciculations. These are tiny little twitches in the muscle, as well as uh, muscle cramps. They can be quite painful at times. And then you can experience uh, problems with the autonomic nervous system. Um, when the autonomic nervous system isn't functioning properly, patients experience uh, orthostatic hypotension, that is dropping their blood pressure when they stand up too quickly, and they experience this as uh, lightheadedness or they can even faint. Uh, men can experience uh, sexual dysfunction and lack of uh, sweating. But at the same time, these can also result in uh, kind of hyperactivation of the autonomic nerve fibers in which patients may experience diarrhea or excessive sweating. So how do we diagnose peripheral neuropathy? Uh, the most critical part of um, coming to a, uh, a diagnosis is actually examining the patient and getting a good history. Uh, the time course of the onset of the symptoms is important the relationship to any medications or other illnesses that the patients have, and family history. Um, after the history and examination, uh, we often uh, do two complementary tests uh, to uh, kind of confirm the type of peripheral neuropathy and also to assess the degree of the severity of the neuropathy. One of these is called uh, EMG nerve conduction studies. As you can see in the top picture, uh, nerve conduction study is conducted by uh, recording uh, from different nerves uh, in the uh, distal parts of the limbs, like the hands or the legs, and stimulating the nerves with an electrical stimulator. And we're basically looking at how the nerve is conducting that electrical impulse, impulse that we get. That tells us if the nerve is degenerating and is it a problem in the axon or it's a problem in the myelin.
But in some patients where the neuropathy is at the earlier stages and they may not have any problem with their um, large nerve fibers, uh, the EMG nerve conduction studies might be normal. And the reason for that is the EMG nerve conduction studies do not check the integrity of the small sensory nerve fibers, the ones that goes to your skin. So in the last uh, 25, uh, 30 years, um, what we have developed is that you can actually evaluate those small nerve endings in the skin by actually doing little punch biopsies uh, along the leg at different sites. And we, as you can see in the uh, right lower panel, we can actually stain these nerve fibers and count them. We can look at their morphology. And in the left, uh, you see that the uh, density of the nerve fibers is normal. And these are the thin uh, strands of dark stains that are highlighted by the yellow arrowheads. Uh, on the right panel, you see that uh, the nerve fiber density is reduced. There are fewer of them, and uh, some of them have these large swellings, and those are typical of what we call pre-degenerative changes. So combination of the EMG nerve conduction studies and the skin biopsy uh, tells us the state of the peripheral nerves. Uh, but they do not tell about the cause of the peripheral neuropathy. That comes from the history and examination, along with the additional laboratory tests that we do. Uh, we screen patients for uh, diabetes, um, for uh, rheumatological diseases, for history of uh, cancer drugs, um, markers of other inflammatory disease or infections such as HIV, hepatitis, syphilis. And we also look for vitamin deficiencies that can cause peripheral neuropathy, such as vitamin B12 deficiency or thiamine deficiency. So when we put all these together, that helps us to understand uh, what is the type of peripheral neuropathy the patient has and what are the um, causes of it. We rarely end up doing a nerve biopsy or an MRI scan or a spinal tap to look for rare types of peripheral neuropathy, but typically, especially for cancer patients, these are not necessary. So what can we do after the diagnosis? Uh, so the treatment of peripheral neuropathy is really dictated by the cause, the type, and the severity of the symptoms. So if you have somebody who has an inflammatory neuropathy or what we call autoimmune neuropathy, obviously we can use um, immune modulatory therapies to uh, suppress their immune system and help their nerves recover on their own. Um, but if it is, say, from diabetes, we try to treat the underlying diabetes to uh, keep the disease under control. However, if it is idiopathic or if it's something like cancer drugs uh, that the patient has already completed their cancer uh, chemotherapy um, and they were left with the symptoms of peripheral neuropathy, there isn't really much we can do. We can help uh, control the symptoms, uh, but we can't really fix the numbness or the lack of sensation. And there currently, there isn't really any good treatment that helps the re regenerated nerves uh, beyond what they do naturally, except perhaps exercise. So as a cancer patient, if you're going to get chemotherapy, is there anything you can do to prevent development of the uh, peripheral neuropathy? Can you reduce your risk? Um, so one of the uh, recent discoveries is that exercise seems to play a very important role uh, in this process. In fact, there are a couple uh, ongoing clinical trials in cancer patients who are undergoing chemotherapy to find out if exercise uh, can actually reduce the risk. We know that it definitely helps regenerate the nerves in patients with diabetes and diabetic neuropathy. So... Uh, uh, usually when I uh, see patients who are going to go uh, undergo chemotherapy, I ask them to uh, start a rig relatively rigorous exercise regimen. Um, and also you want to avoid secondary risk factors such as smoking, alcohol, or, or a concomitant uh, B12 deficiency, or poorly controlled diabetes. So with regards to specifically for the chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, obviously, if the patient starts to develop peripheral neuropathy, the oncologist usually tries to adjust the dose or has to stop the chemotherapy because the patient's neuropathy is very severe. So the good news uh, is after you develop chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, 
um, which can be quite high with some regimens. Uh, for example, um, patients receiving uh, platinum compounds or paclitaxel may develop perfineuropathy in up to 80% of the time. However, half of these patients will improve, and that's why we end up with about 30 to 40% of patients uh, with paraffin neuropathy when we look at them two years out of their chemo. But this process is very slow because the reason is the human nerves regenerate extremely slowly, about a millimeter a day, which is about an inch a month. So um, what can you do while you're waiting for the nurse to recover? Um, if the patient symptoms are really painful, uh, we can try different type of medications, and these can be uh, from one of these uh, different classes. If it's um, the first line is usually an anti-epileptic drug such as Neurontin or Lyrica, uh, or an antidepressant such as Cymbalta or Amitriptyline. Um, obviously, opioid drugs uh, do play a role in managing painful symptoms, but often you end up uh, um, chasing the dose, uh, often increasing it. And in patients who have very focal symptoms, such as burning only in their toes or in their feet, sometimes uh, using uh, lidoderm or capsaicin cream might be helpful. For patients who have balance issues, I usually refer them to physical therapy and recommend Tai Chi as an exercise to help with their balance. Um, in addition, um, uh, patients who have severe uh, pain but uh, medications don't work, uh, you can try acupuncture, biofeedback, or uh, different types of electrical stimulation paradigms. So what's on the horizon? Um, as this um, cartoon shows, unfortunately, there's no cure. There's not even a race for a cure for paraffin neuropathy. But uh, I've been using this um, slide uh, for the last 10 years. However, in the last couple of years, things uh, started to change. Um, one of the reasons is that we've now uh, identified some of the molecules involved in uh, programmed axon degeneration. Um, and one of these molecules is called SARM1, S-A-R-M1. And currently there are inhibitors of this pathway that are being developed. And um, hopefully this will lead to um, uh, clinically uh, useful uh, drugs. And, and these drugs are going to be first tried in chemotherapy induced paraffin neuropathy because uh, we can actually give these drugs that helps prevent uh, neuropathy in mouse models to patients before they get their chemotherapy so that uh, when they receive their um, chemo, their nerves are in a more quote unquote resistant state uh, so that they won't degenerate. In addition, um, we're part of a multi-institution consortium where we're trying to better understand uh, patients with paraffin neuropathy. This is the paraffin neuropathy research registry that is managed by the Foundation for Paraffin Neuropathy. And um, in this registry, we are um, uh, studying patients with paraffin neuropathy, including chemotherapy-induced paraffin neuropathy patients. Uh, to better understand uh, the correlations between risk factors and the degree and type of paraffin neuropathy, as well as collecting blood from these patients to understand uh, potential genetic risk factors that help us uh, uh, predict which patients are more likely to get uh, paraffin neuropathy. And with that, I will stop and answer any uh, questions that you may have. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cindy Thompson, and I'm a professor in the College of Public Health at the University of Arizona, where I also lead the Cancer Prevention and Control Program at the University of Arizona Cancer Center. Today, I'd like to talk to you about healthy intake, healthy output, and the role of diet in optimizing health for colorectal cancer survivorship. Now, many of you are aware of the risk factors for colorectal cancer, and I bring this to your attention because these risk factors are also important in terms of cancer survivorship. So beyond our family history, we want to think about things like diabetes, obesity, as well as dietary factors that we're going to expand on today, such as alcohol consumption, red meat consumption, processed meat consumption, and sugar-sweetened beverage consumption. 
So when I think about the cancer survivor and the context of how we use diet to promote health and well-being, I think about this overall illustration that I have for you here. As a survivor, you've probably undergone surgery, perhaps chemotherapy, perhaps radiation therapy, perhaps all of the above. And these treatments that we use for cancer cause a lot of side effects. So I name a few here like fatigue, anxiety, depression, but most importantly for colorectal cancer survivors, they also can cause significant bowel symptoms. All of these factors can then contribute to things like increased inflammation, reduced muscle mass, reductions in metabolic rate, reduced energy needs. And overall, the concern is that after cancer treatment, we end up with weight gain, reduced physical function, and perhaps even comorbidities that can affect our quality of life as well as survivorship. So my goal today is really to talk to you about the importance of lifestyle in intervening on this pathway to improve your overall quality of life, your health, and reduce any morbidities as well as mortality related to colorectal cancer. And in fact, what we know is that as cancer survivors, many people will find that they get on a trajectory of accelerated aging, where their physical activity, their frailty, their sarcopenia, even their dependence may increase related to the fact that they're losing physical function after treatment. And so today what I wanna do is tell you that through healthy eating and physical activity, we can get us, ourselves back on the successful aging trajectory that will result in overall well-being and extended lifespan. So the American Cancer Society promotes guidelines for cancer survival. And actually these are under review right now and we expect an update in the summer of 2021. But overall, the literature is very consistent. It's important that cancer survivors maintain a healthy body weight, adopt a physically active lifestyle, eat a diet with an emphasis on plant sources, choose whole grains for increased fiber, limit processed and red meat, particularly for colorectal cancer survivors, and limit alcohol intake if you consume alcohol at all. So do these exposures actually translate into improved survival? Well, yes, they do. And in fact, your pre-diagnosis diet can also impact your overall survival. So it's really important to think about in terms of people in your family who may be at higher risk for can colorectal cancer after your diagnosis, simply based on family history, that they also adopt these healthy lifestyle behaviors related to diet in an effort to reduce their risk of ever having colorectal cancer. So, one of the things that's really interesting, and I'm going to talk about the specific dietary behavior changes that we are looking for after a colorectal cancer diagnosis, but I also want to point out to you that unfortunately, when we do ask colorectal cancer survivors about whether they change their diet to be healthier after their diagnosis, there's a significant percentage of individuals who have not. So here on the left, I have the various foods that come into play. Of course, we want increased intake of vegetables and whole grains and reduced intake of whole fat dairy, red meat, and grilled foods. But what you see is in non-Hispanic whites as well as blacks is that there's a large percentage of people who make no change in these behaviors. There are some that do, and I don't want to negate the fact that some people are increasing their vegetable intake and their whole grains and reducing their fat intake and red meat intake. But we have a long way to go. And so we need to really support survivors as they try to make these changes in their diets. When we look at the American Cancer Society guidelines for cancer preventive behaviors, 
related to the body weight, related to the physical activity, related to a healthy diet that's strong in plant foods, and that reduces alcohol intake. What we find is we can kind of score people on all of these behaviors. And then we can say, does this reduce their risk of cancer mortality? And what was amazing in the study of all women that we looked at, there was a 52% lower risk of colorectal cancer among people, women who adhere to these guidelines and a 71% lower risk of death over the 15 years that we followed them. And the greatest protection was for colorectal cancer, far above the other cancers. So it's very important that we realize that these guidelines not only are based on associations, but when we actually look at individuals who adhere to these guidelines, we see better outcomes. And in fact, these outcomes relate a lot to dietary patterns. So previously, we used to spend a lot of time going, well, should I get more calcium? Should I get more folate? Should I get more fiber? Should I get more X, Y, Z? And over time, what we've realized is that what's really important is the pattern of intake. And what we want to do is reduce the intake of Western foods like fast foods, high fat foods, a lot of convenient foods, and promote the intake of a prudent diet pattern that is that plant-based pattern that's lower in fat, higher in fiber, higher in fruits and vegetables. And what you see on the right here is the high rate or hazard of death related to a Western diet pattern in colorectal cancer survivors versus those who follow a prudent diet where there's very low or very modest increase in mortality related to this disease. On the left, I also provide some additional epidemiological studies that suggest that eating a healthy eating pattern, such as the healthy eating index, or the, a lower inflammatory diet, like the, the, the Mediterranean diet, can be protective in this regard. And in fact, here's just additional epidemiological data showing several different studies that show a reduction in mortality when people eat healthy versus the Western diet, which increases your risk of lower cancer survival. Now, I want to point out that body composition matters. Yes, being overweight is a concern, but it's even more complex than that. We know that being overweight, when you have an apple shape versus a pear shape is more problematic. So that visceral fat that collects around our middle is what we want to avoid. And in fact, on the right here, what we show are survival curves. And basically what you see is that the dark line is the poorest survival. And that line correlates with people who have a lot of adiposity or body fat, as well as low muscle mass. So it's very important that we consume a diet that helps us maintain a healthy body weight, but also protects us from losses in lean mass, which means adequate plant proteins and physical activity on a regular basis. Now, the cancer prevention recommendations that have been published by the American Cancer Society, the American Institute of Cancer Research, and the NCCN all recommend these various healthy eating patterns where you maintain a healthy body weight, you eat a lot of vegetables, you avoid fast foods, you avoid red and processed meat, you avoid sugar and sweetened beverages, limit or avoid alcohol, and then make sure that you follow this eating pattern on a regular basis throughout life. And these prevention guidelines have been largely supported in the survivorship setting as well. So what is a person to eat to improve survival after colorectal cancer? That's what we really want to know. Well, in a nutshell, we're going to talk about eating less food to maintain a healthy body weight, making sure you get the variety that allows you to have adequate calcium, vitamin D, and fiber that are important micronutrients that play a role in survivorship, more plant foods that are whole and fresh, 
And then we don't want to lose sight that we want to enjoy our food. We want to spend time with others and enjoy healthy food that makes us happy. So as I talked about, dietary patterns matter. And so here are two patterns that you can think about that would be helpful in terms of overall survival and reducing comorbidities like hypertension or diabetes or cardiovascular disease after your cancer diagnosis. And you can see that these two patterns are very similar in promoting a lot of plant foods. So what does healthy eating look like? Well, here's one example for sure. But it's also a diet that's high in variety of fruits and vegetables that help to reduce inflammation, act as antioxidants, and promote gut health. And in fact, calcium is also important. Two large epidemiological studies have now shown reductions in um, mortality after colorectal cancer between 28 and 33% if you get enough calcium and vitamin D in your diet, or these may be taken as supplements. We wanna talk about takeoffs. Stay away from a high consumption of meat, particularly processed meats or grilled meats that have high levels of reduced advanced glycogen end products that promote cancer and actually are carcinogens. We want to watch out for alcohol. It doesn't matter what form, moderation or avoidance altogether, because we know that alcohol itself is a carcinogen that can suppress our immune systems and cause DNA damage associated with cancer. We also want to make sure that we stay away from sugar. Now, while sugar doesn't feed cancer, it does increase insulin levels and higher insulin levels, as well as diabetes, are associated with higher risks of cancer recurrence as well as poorer survival. We also want to think about the gut. You know, colorectal cancer is happening in the gut, and the surgery and the antibiotics that we get when we go through these surgeries can unfavorably change the gut microbiome, as can a Western eating pattern that we talked about before. So it's really important to think about how you nourish your gut itself to promote health. That means trying to consume diets that are rich in prebiotics and probiotics, as with the numerous foods that are listed here. In addition, think about other things you can be doing along with healthy eating, avoiding smoke or including secondhand smoke exercising rate regularly, avoiding weight gain, making sure you're watching out the, for that alcohol consumption, stay connected with others and socially engaged, make sure that you get your screenings regularly and on time, and finally be able to laugh at the you know, issues that confront you so that you can enjoy life because attitude matters as well. We want to make sure that as you move forward as a cancer survivor, that you get the support you need to not only eat healthy and be physically active, but to maintain a healthy weight, to maintain healthy sleep that also helps your weight management, and that these services are reimbursable so that you don't have to put out a lot of after treatment costs to maintain a healthy lifestyle. In summary, people survive cancer and diet and nutrition are an important part of that healthy survivorship. Cancer treatment is associated with significant health problems and concerns in most individuals, but not all. And diet can be used to improve symptoms and improve quality of life as well as survival. Behavior change is a challenge. You need to build your self-confidence, your self-efficacy to be able to really address the barriers and facilitators that allow you to eat healthy. And monitoring your daily diet can help you to stay on track. Thank you. And at this time, we'd like to take any questions across the panel members. Right. I don't know if I am on or not. Looks like I might be. Are my co-panelists there? I see them. There's Cindy, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Hoke. Welcome. Hello. Um, good to see you. Uh, I, Andrea, are you going to join us too? I we include everybody. 
we've got a series of questions that I'll sort of address and, and bring up and try to moderate a discussion. And, and to get us started, uh, Dr. Thompson, Cindy, you know, uh, we're, your, your presentation w was awesome, but I have to say I feel a little bit guilty. Like I've got a thing of chocolate over there from Halloween. Um, patients bring me bourbon that's up there. So what am I supposed to do, not drink it? And you talk about joy and living and but at the same time, I can't have a steak. I can have a steak every now and then. But I liked what you said very much about everything's about moderation. It's not 100% avoidance. It's themes. It's what's your overriding theme and what you're eating and how you're living. And I'll put the asterisks on this that my daughter, 24 years old, has become sort of a vegetarian. And she's influenced my wife and me to the point now that our diets are extremely focused in a more vegetarian. Uh, I think we were, we're, we're, we're going to your same church, if you will, about, about eating at our house. So could you, but, but patients feel very compelled to try and control their outcome as much as they can. And I do think diet and lifestyle contribute. So maybe just some feedback on, on those comments of applying what you've taught us to sort of real world living. Yeah, and I think that's really important. And hopefully that was clear in my messaging. If you, you know, feel like you want a little piece of chocolate, that's fine. But, you know, we can always think about, well, could I kind of be a convert and use dark chocolate that might be richer in polyphenols? Or could if I'm going to have alcohol, can I pay attention to my portion sizes and make sure that I'm measuring out a reasonable amount or having one beer and not four beers. So I think it's it's trying to find that balance where you can still enjoy those foods, you can still, you know, engage in that kind of specialty eating when you want to, but also just have an awareness that, you know, if your piece of meat is two ounces, that's a lot better than 12 ounces. And and you can just moderate along the way and integrate these foods when you need to. I always tell people, I, I see myself at, not as a vegetarian, but as a meat avoider or a meat limiter. If I go to a friend's house and they offer up steak, I'm not gonna say, I don't eat steak, I'm vegetarian. I'm gonna indulge, but be conscious about how much I'm eating and be sure to have a nice side of vegetables. Yeah, I mean, we've been, um... Uh, you know, when you go to a restaurant or something, what they give you is way too much anyway. So, um, you know, taking half home for another time later mm -hmm. in the week has been a strategy for us. So thank you very much. Great. I think yeah. the data that you showed is is, is just awesome. Dr. Hope, um, I wanted to ask, so, uh, you know, we hand out a lot of oxaliplatin around here and many of our listeners uh, are dealing with that. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about why in some patients, their neuropathy worsens after they've stopped um, and then has this sort of slow decline. The, 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 you know, like a month or two or three later is when they'll start to see the neuropathy when we tried to stop it ahead of that. Any thoughts on the mechanism of that and how we as clinicians and patients could avoid that? Yeah, uh, so that's an uh, important point you're making. Um, that's a phenomenon that we call coasting phenomenon. And we see that in some patients um, where the um, axon degeneration and their neuropathy seems, the symptom seems to persist uh, for about a month or two, even after they stop the um, chemotherapy. We really don't have a good handle on the molecular mechanisms of that. Um, but we see that not just with oxaliplatin, but also with paclitaxel and other uh, classes of chemotherapy drugs as well. Um, it's possible that there's some sort of a genetic predisposition because we don't see it in every patient. Um, it could be a problem with their metabolism rate. Um, we really don't have a good molecular understanding. Um, but as, as you pointed out, uh, the most important thing is really if the patient is developing a very severe neuropathy is uh, to stop the medication or adjust the dose so that uh, you get ahead of it uh, before it becomes a, uh, a completely irreversible neuropathy. Yeah, there was some lore in our literature and actually became a pretty standard practice for a while of prehydrating with calcium and magnesium to try and prevent oxaliplatin neuropathy. And 
people were spending longer and longer in the infusion units to get these hydration runs. Mm -hmm. And then a study really came back to say it didn't do much for, for people. So that has fallen off. Is, is there anything we should be doing? Are there, is there science and prevention uh, that you know of that we should be thinking about? The only thing, as I pointed out in my talk, is really the exercise. Um, and, and we don't have data from uh, chemotherapy patients yet. Uh, there are a couple of clinical trials ongoing. But the data from the diabetic neuropathy patients and the pre-diabetic neuropathy patients, a rigorous exercise regimen really uh, seems to slow down the development or progression of peripheral neuropathy, and in fact, improves it in some patients with prediabetes. And in animal models that we've published, um, if you put a mouse on a, a treadmill for two weeks before you give them chemotherapy, they don't develop uh, as severe neuropathy as the mice that weren't given uh, exercise. Um, so clearly, that seems to be very important. And I think that that's part of the healthy lifestyle, you know, eating a balanced, healthy diet and exercising is the best thing that we know right now to reduce the risk of these type of complications. So, so we should replace our infusion chairs with Peloton bikes. Is, is this what you're telling me? Something like that. That would make everybody happy. You know, you're getting your exercise, you know, you're, yeah, they're on steroids anyway. So they're, you know, I might as well use that, that high and, and, and let it yeah. rip. Could, could I, I get both of you? Yeah, sorry. Could I, I, was, both of you? I tell my patients, you know, uh, get a small uh, exercise bike um, and, and while you're watching your TV, just uh, step on it. Um, you know, yeah. it, you can buy one relatively cheap. It doesn't have to be a Peloton, uh, but. <laughs> yeah, you, you both kind of mention it and it's an area of science that I am totally excited about. Um, particularly as we're seeing these young people come up with colon cancer, people with not bad habits, quote unquote, getting colon cancer, that the, the, the microbiome, our gut biome is playing an increasing role in our health. Uh, as, the more we study it, the more we understand that it is part of us and is part of our health. And I, I think about obesity and why can some people eat whatever they want, but other people living on Diet Coke still get heavy. Um, and I, I increasingly am convinced that microbiome is playing a role. Could you both comment on, and Cindy, maybe you go first about, is the diet really a direct effect of having more calcium and vitamin D, or is it an indirect effect of somehow altering our feeding our microbiome? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think we have a lot still to learn. Um, we know that the microbiome is established relatively early in life and that once it's established, it's a little difficult to change, but something like taking on a plant-based diet um, definitely can make for a more, quote, favorable um, population of bacteria in our guts. Um, we also have some interesting data out of melanoma um, at MD Anderson, where people on immune therapy seem to be particularly responsive to therapy when they go on more of a plant-based diet. Um, we also know that we can use probiotics to promote a healthier microbiome as well. So I think it's, it's part of the answer. I don't think it's a magic bullet. I think it's important to understand that your microbiome um, tends to go, we disrupt it a lot when we go through our GI surgery and we have antibiotics at high levels, um, but it tends to go back to its normal. And if you really wanna get a healthier microbiome, you have to really make significant changes towards a more plant-based diet and perhaps supplementation with probiotics. Um, and again, one piece of, of a lot of things we could be doing to improve our lifestyles and uh, ultimately improve our survival. Yeah, okay. Dr. Hoke, any comments on microbiome in your world? Yeah, so that's a uh, very uh, interesting area of research that we're really just starting to explore. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the uh, work in the peripheral neuropathy world has come actually from the autoimmune types of neuropathies where the clearly there's a role for the immune mediated action. Um, as far as I know, it hasn't been really studied in the context of chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy, uh, but I suspect it definitely plays a role. 
because the immune um, activation um, definitely plays a role, especially in the painful symptoms of peripheral neuropathy. Again, coming from the diabetic neuropathy world, um, there is um, uh, infiltration of the dorsal root ganglia. That's where the sensory neurons reside uh, by in inflammatory cells. Um, and um, uh, that seems to correlate with increase in painful symptoms. Um, and then uh, whether something similar is happening in chemotherapy-induced neuropathy patients, uh, we really don't know. Uh, but I suspect it does. And, um, you know, uh, as Dr. Thompson is commenting, trying to come up with a favorable um, kind of anti-inflammatory microbiome, I think is should be a goal for all patients. A couple of questions that are sort of for long-term follow-up patients, the five-year mark, for example. Um, that The real mark is about three years, to be honest. Most colon cancers, 95% of colon cancers, if there are seeds out there, will have shown themselves by three years, uh, one way or the other. Um, there is a tail on that curve for year four and year five, where you do see some additional um, uh, patients will relapse, and very rarely after five years. It happens, but very, very rarely. In contrast to, say, breast cancer, certain kinds of breast cancer that can 20 years later uh, come back, meaning cells from the original breast cancer have lurked, have hung out, have not shown themselves for 20 years, and eventually uh, we think that's an angiogenic switch. That's a theory that, have, that they all of a sudden get a blood supply and then they grow. So for the most part, that's where that three-year and five-year mark comes. And, and at least right now, we believe that that doesn't matter when you started your journey. So if you were a 25-year-old with colon cancer or a 70-year-old with colon cancer, we still track you for about five years. And it's interesting how the pendulum has swung from very intensive follow-up, frequent scans, blood tests, to now a little bit more spread out um, so that we are not putting you through all the testing, but at the same time checking for those patients who uh, may have potentially curable metastatic disease. Um, and someone asked about CEA, other, other ways to follow if your CEA is not positive. Yeah, there are some other blood tests that are out there. We think this new CT DNA may be helpful, but then there are some where, you know, we don't have a good handle on detecting uh, persistence of cancer. And we really need that. Um, that is going to transform this. If you thought about it, if I, if I could find a test after your surgery and define you as the group that's cured, and don't need any chemotherapy, well, then you can go on with your life. Uh, you can alter your diet so you don't get cancer again, um, <laughs> but you don't have to spend the next three to five years uh, worrying about whether you're going to die or not. And you don't have to worry about neuropathy because we're not gonna give you drugs uh, anyway. So it then becomes uh, just identifying those people who are at risk. And so I think that's going to help us a lot. Um, I, maybe just as we get start to wind down, um, People talk a little bit about your, the, the, your take on the importance of mental health um, as you go through. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I certainly know from my perspective, it's, it's very, very important. I, I joke that the, your, your, your soul is, in fact, in your microbiome. So keeping a happier microbiome keeps your happier soul. Um, but nonetheless, um, we all emphasize this. Some days it's easier than others, particularly nowadays. Um, it's hard to keep a positive attitude when there's so many uncertainties in the world and you throw cancer on top of that. Uh, but Dr. Thompson, maybe I'll give you first dab. Uh, you know, what the importance of a mental perspective and that may require therapy, it may require, you know, whatever it takes to get there, but really focusing on that. What's your take on that? Well, obviously that's a, a critical part, you know, physical activity, diet, and mental health. And I think that it's extremely important that we realize the connection between what you eat and mental health. And I would uh, highly encourage if you haven't seen the documentary Supersize Me, where a, a vegetarian goes on a fast food diet and the impact on his mental well being is palpable. And so I would strongly encourage you if you don't believe there's a connection. Um, to watch that video. 
I think it's extremely important. I can tell you, you know, it, no matter, you know, you can say three years is all you need for follow up. I'm now 17 years past my colorectal cancer diagnosis and I still worry. Um, and so having that mental, either a, a strong spirituality base um, that's based in your beliefs and values that you can go to daily breathing several times a day if you need to. And I can't underemphasize physical activity. I mean, it it has a major impact on cancer related fatigue. It has an impact on anxiety. Um, you know, I remember when growing up or when I was raising my kids, they would say, mom, think you're having a bad day. Maybe you should go for a run. <laughs> so just remember that, you know, your mental health can be modulated by healthy lifestyle behaviors, as well as your spiritual and breathing practices. Uh, Dr. Hoka, a specialist in our brains, what, what's, uh, what's your take on, on uh, brain yeah. function? I am, I, I'm going to echo Dr. Thompson's comments that I think exercise and being an active person is so important, both for mental health and also for the peripheral nerves. Um, we know that uh, active people and people who regularly exercise, they have um, less severe neuropathy. Uh, people who also avoid Western style diets uh, tend to do better. Uh, metabolic syndrome and hyperglycemia are huge risk factors for developing peripheral neuropathy, or if you develop it from chemo uh, for having a worse outcome. Um, and uh, the other thing is one thing the patients really need to be careful when they develop peripheral neuropathy is that chronic pain really can wear you down. It's very easy to get depressed. And um, I always encourage my patients to seek counseling um, because uh, you know our drugs are not always 100% effective and being in constant pain when your hands and feet are burning is not easy. Uh, so um, in addition to medications, um, uh, biofeedback and uh, other modalities, non-medical modalities to help cope with the uh, painful symptoms is very important. Um, but that's one of the reasons why medications like Cymbalta is um, almost my first choice nowadays if the patient is also uh, exhibiting uh, depressive symptoms. Okay. Well, we have run out of time. I, we could probably go on another hour together. Um, many of the recommendations that we have made of eating uh, healthfully, as we describe it, and having time for exercise is for many a luxury item. Not everyone can afford the food that we're talking about um, and or the time commitment that's required to find time to exercise or, or access that. But we want to make sure we help each other as we move forward uh, in our survivorship together on this planet. And those who uh, continue to face the struggles of colorectal cancer, we want to give you a special shout out um, that as many of us are here to, to help you uh, uh, get what you need. And, and we hope this session really helps uh, and provides you some groundwork uh, on that. So to my co-panelists, thank you guys so much. And it was, I learned a lot this morning. Thank you. And thanks to the Colorectal Cancer yeah. Alliance for, for supporting this symposium. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. A lot too.